Productivity isn't about doing more, it's doing what's most important. It's looking at your life, it's looking at your business and figuring out what are the things that move the needle? What are the things that are making the biggest impact? You can treat the body like a black box. You don't have to know what's going on inside a system to change the system. To any entrepreneur, the idea that we're gonna take a little bit of rest, I think is the most counterintuitive thing ever. What gets you here won't get you there. But if you try to do more of what got you here, then what will end up happening is that you end up paying a great price. You can have more energy than you're supposed to. You can get more sleep in less time. Protect the asset. That's the rule. You are the asset. Dedicate to what's highest in priority. Delegate anything less. When you choose to do fewer, you'll do them better and you'll feel more excited about it. This is gold to entrepreneurs. And I hope that everybody will do this because I'm certain it will be a value. How did you get so fixated on this Op, you know, bio optimization gig that you're, you're into? Well, I used to weigh 300 pounds <laughs> okay. and uh, I weigh about 200 pounds. It was pure pounds muscle, now. right? Pure muscle. Uh, yeah. It, pure muscle. If you mean fat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. So I still have stretch marks from that time. And I was an entrepreneur. I wanted to be an entrepreneur since I was 12. Uh, I worked in Silicon Valley. I was a co-founder of a part of the the first company or the company that held Google's first server when it was two guys and and the Hotmail and the Facebook and you know the right. the you know Yahoo and and like we basically built the digital infrastructure. I ended up running uh, technology strategy uh, for the company. So if we we're going to buy a company, I would go out and say, "Is this technology worth buying for us or not?" I made six million bucks when I was twenty six. I lost it when I was twenty eight. That's part of the millionaire secrets. So you got to like be a millionaire and then stay a millionaire, whole different game. <laughs> but what I, uh, what I learned along the way is, okay, I'm fat. Um, I'm starting to get brain fog. That is, uh, it, it's affecting my career. I can't remember stuff. I'm, I'm in the most exciting time. I'm doing stuff that is meaningful. I'm teaching classes at the University of California, but like, how are we going to build the internet? What is, what is cloud computing before it has a name? And just all this the stuff that was like the coolest, just seeing like a whole new life form emerge, you know, a whole new era. And I'm doing that and then just being so tired, I could barely put one foot in front of the other. Like I've got the accelerator pressed all the way to the floor and I'm slowing down and you can't push any further. There's no more room to go. So it wasn't a lack of desire. So I thought, well, maybe it is, you know, maybe it's a, a moral failing. It's a willpower problem or something. So I went through this where I'm externally really successful, but uh, inside I'm like, I'm pushing as hard as, as a human can push. And and I went to the doctor. I said, I feel like I've been poisoned. Like, like I, I can't think. And they did some tests. And they said, oh yeah, high risk of stroke and heart attack. I'm like, I'm not 30. I'm going to die like I'm old. And I've had arthritis since I was 14. And I'm a 46 inch waist. And like, what is going on? So clearly I'm eating too much lettuce because everyone I know is eating the Western bacon cheeseburger. And I'm eating the chicken salad with no dressing and no chicken. Right? And I just realized I'm working out at 18, uh, let's see, for 18 months, I worked out an hour and a half every day, religiously, six days a week. I didn't care if I was sick, didn't care if I had a keynote or whatever. I just, I did it. Didn't matter. And that's where I finally just got pissed off. And I said, all right, I'm going to have to become an expert because what I'm doing doesn't work. The doctor looks at me, thinks I'm eating cheesecake and I'm not, right? So I fired my doctor when he told me vitamin C would kill me. And actually they're still saying the same thing today. Uh, at least some of them are. And I went off and I said, I'm gonna have to learn it myself. And because I'm a computer hacker, because I studied artificial intelligence and distributed systems management, you can treat the body like a black box. You don't have to know what's going on inside a system to change the system. You have to measure inputs and outputs and just do what's necessary. And that became a movement I started called biohacking. It's a new word in the English language. My name is in Miriam Webster's, which is crazy. And what that is, is the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside of you so you have full control of your own biology. And Bulletproof started, and biohacking started, because no one had ever talked to us. The entrepreneurs, the world changers, the you know, software developers, venture capitalists. And so I wrote this blog. It was actually originally called The Bulletproof Executive. And it was, here's, if someone had told me this, when I was 20, it would have saved me at the time $300,000 in biological upgrades that were unnecessary. At this point, I've spent a million bucks on my own biology and continue to do so uh, because I'm looking to go way beyond you know, baseline human. And what, what just 
really was irritating to me it is, is that no one's ever talked to us. So I started this blog saying, look, you actually might not want to look like a balloon animal, you know, full respect to bodybuilders, but like, I don't really want that look because it's one that's not correlated with longevity and it's a lot of work. And I'd rather put the work into my family and my company, right? So the New York Times calls me almost muscular. I'm like mission accomplished. <laughs> that, that's what I wanted because that's what makes you live the longest. And that means you, you're in good shape, but you're not over muscled, which actually reduces your lifespan. And if you're under muscle, that reduces your lifespan. So I started optimizing for that kind of a thing. Found out you can raise your IQ. You can change pattern matching in your nervous system. Uh, and you can have more energy than you're supposed to. Uh, you can get more sleep in less time, uh, which is something I've become very good at. And I have started a biohacking conference and created a movement. And you know, seven years or eight years later, uh, the conference is still going strong. We're doing a virtual one this year. But the idea here is, get your hardware working to your three Ps. And when that works, you can do the emotional work that it takes to do in order to be a good entrepreneur. Because an entrepreneur who's physically unhealthy is going to make bad decisions because the electrons that are supposed to be going into your ability to control your emotions go into your expanding waistline. Like it, it's math. <laughs> so, and I'm not saying, you know, fat people are bad people. I was a 300 pounder. What I'm saying is when you're fat, some of your energy is going into biological stuff that should be going into changing the world or managing your company or holding space or grounding yourself or being a, a family member, a community member, whatever is important. And that's why physical stuff matters for entrepreneurs. And that's why you see the CEOs of most big companies. They don't look like fat guys drinking, you know, martinis and smoking cigars anymore because you can't do that work if you look that way, right? And if you do look that way and you're doing that work, I know how you feel because I look that way in my mid twenties. You feel like, good God, I can barely keep up here. My, my head's above water, but man, I'm pushing it. And you're kind of miserable and kind of anxious, right? You're not going to show that to people. You're going to show up in the boardroom. You're going to cross your arms mm -hmm, and you're going to you know, project power and put on your game face and all that stuff that everyone knows how to do if they've lived in corporate America or they've achieved a degree of success. But we can all tell, not because how you looked, but every human can tell when another human is inauthentic. And so if you're in that room going, you know, I can barely, barely stay on my feet here, but I'm just going to bite my cheek and I'm going to focus. I know that was me. Uh, you're going to be able to do that. Uh, but we're, people will know, right? Versus someone who walks in and is like, I'm bursting with energy. I give like 17 shits about this. I am so freaking excited. Like, I want to be here. I want to do this. I'm all in. You can feel that and you cannot fake it. Right. And it's that, that degree of authenticity as I am full of energy because I'm full of energy, not because I'm acting full of energy. That's why you have to exercise if you're an entrepreneur, except exercise is maybe 10% of the problem. It's actually food is 90% of it. And that was the lie that had me work out 90 minutes a day, six days a week. Most entrepreneurs I've ever coached, they over exercise and under recover. And like, how many times have I coached someone where it's like, oh, I'm going to run the Ironman in Kona. Uh, and I was just in Japan yesterday. I'm flying around the world. I'm going to take my company public this year. And, and I'm like, let me just predict something. You can't get it up. You sleep like shit and you're a zombie all the time. And they're like, how did you know? <laughs> because the professional Ironman athletes actually just exercise and recover than do anything else. A CEO uses as much energy in a typical day as a, a quarterback in the Super Bowl. Like we are cognitively in it. And, and this is why when I started my little blog that I thought five people would read that more than that did, um, the first people who read it were Silicon Valley entrepreneurs because I wrote it in language that we would care about. And the second people were Wall Street people. Mm -hmm. And the third people were Hollywood and uh, uh, in the music industry. Uh, and after that, it was uh, just like other general uh, professional sports athletes. Why? Every one of those categories are people who have to have their brains work more than is sane. They have to look good, at least in most of those professions, at least good enough, especially as you're an actor, and they have physical demands, right? So these are the worst and hardest jobs. We have circadian disruption because you're flying all over the place, right? You have constant demands for your attention and your brain's ability to act like a muscle is very strong, right? And, and they're the ones who said, you know, yeah, I'm drinking my, my Bulletproof coffee because it worked. And like Ed Sheeran's on the red carpet talking about this, saying, I just had my Bulletproof coffee. I'm like, did that just happen? Like I saw that on Extra and, and Shailene Woodley and Jimmy Fallon are talking about it and Jim Carrey licks it off the desk when he spills it during an interview. And I'm like, I've never met these people. I didn't pay them a nickel. I, I couldn't pay them to do that. 
Um, they just did it because like I got my brain back and entrepreneurs everywhere who don't have their physical stuff together, they are suffering, right? And when you suffer, your company, it's an energetic reflection of you. And, and this goes back to, you know, the meditation with the masters in Tibet that I've done and, you know, a lot of the personal development stuff I do uh, at the neuroscience company I started called 40 Years of Zen. So we, we bring executives in for five days of intense work with electrodes on their head to show them what's going on and let them, you know, reprogram and upgrade cognitive function and electrons in the brain and stuff like that. But what you hear after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people like that is that there's a lot of people going, man, I, I can barely keep it together. But when you get it to the point where there's a sense of effortlessness and a sense of extra energy, and you walk into your office or you dial into your office as the case may be, and people feel it, they're like, oh my God. And all of a sudden the stuff that was wobbly in your company, it stops wobbling, right? And the culture of your company reflects how you feel when you wake up in the morning. And if you wake up zombified and stressed, I can't tell you how, this is that weird you know, meditation land, but it's there. And any experienced entrepreneur tells you, man, when, I got, when, when everything's working in, in my, my cell phone, I've just got the right vibe, I'm unstoppable and my company is unstoppable. And then when I'm completely you know, scrambled, it doesn't matter if we're doing the right things, it just doesn't work right. And, and it's that thing they don't teach you at business school. I went to Wharton, got my MBA there. They don't teach that. They don't teach the spiritual side of being an entrepreneur. Get your physical hardware working, get your emotions in order, and you handle that and your company is just this amazing machine. And if you don't do those two things, your company wobbles around. You might succeed, you might not succeed. And even if you do succeed, you'll be unhappy. And I'm going, yes! <laughs> There's something else for digital marketers uh, that, that goes deeper. If you're good at writing copy... And I'm going to say, I think I'm pretty good at it, just given the success I've had, you know, 200 million downloads on Bulletproof Radio, um, mm -hmm. you know, all, all that stuff. So I, I'm just going to say, I, I'm going to give myself at least an eight out of 10, <laughs> um, just, just uh, without trying to, you know, be egotistical about that. Um, when, you, when you write something, if you're not stuffing your face full of potato chips and diet soda and energy drinks and all those things, words, if your body is running clean, your ability to sense the emotion in your words is much higher. Mm. If you meditate, your ability to sense it is. The reason I can do what I do is I spent four months with electrodes on my head going through and getting rid of garbage pattern matching that I had in my nervous system about trauma, about being bullied you know, about all sorts of things where like, oh, you're feeling anxiety or you're feeling this, you know, this thing's against you or all the weird things that seem to be true that we actually don't have any evidence are true. So basically getting out of my own way, erasing garbage beliefs that were not based in reality. They're just based in what I thought was real. By the way, this is the human condition. Everyone does this. Everyone has this um, if you're alive. So what happens then is, okay, you get this stuff out of your way and you can write better. So when I sit down to write something, I look at every single word as if I'm doing the 40 years in neurofeedback. And I can feel what a word does in my chest. I can feel all the firewall types of resistance that we have. And everyone you're writing copy for has a firewall running. And some of it they have consciously developed, but 99% of it was developed by teachers and their parents and early childhood experiences. So you can pick a word, right? And if you are a really good digital marketer, you know what firewall rules that's going to trip. And, you, and when you see a, a professional diver, uh, like in the Olympics, they dive into the water and there's no splash. When your words are well-written, it enters someone's consciousness without a splash, Right. And if the words themselves have bad content, they won't enter without a splash because that's why people have all these automated systems to keep garbage out of their heads. They don't work very well, but they have them. And if your words are worthy and you choose words that are non-triggering, you'll find that people read it and go, oh, those are real instead of, oh, those are fake digital marketing garbage, delete, check the spam filter box. Right. And that is the hardest part of doing this, but you cannot do that unless you have the cultivated ability to feel your nervous system at a subtle level, which can come from technology, can come from ancient practice, can come from breathing exercises, from meditation, from heart rate variability training, all the core biohacking technologies I talk about to just get better instrumentation of your body. So your body is the measurement system for the words you write. 
And when you do that, you're like, oh, that doesn't work. And it's surprising to me. So I, that's how I developed the, the Bulletproof name. That's how I developed the taglines, all the product names. And it's funny, Jay Abraham, who's a, a dear friend, and uh, has he ever been on your show? Is he a, a known uh, entity? No, we're audience? actually in talks with his team right now. So cross you, your fingers. You should have him on. He's, he's a dear friend and a mentor. And he's written uh, uh, countless books, you know, the kind of books you spend $1,000 for and you're yeah, glad yeah. you did. He's, he's, the, he's a godfather, one of the godfathers. He, he is. And I used one of his $1,200 books when I was starting Bulletproof. Cause I'm like, God, this is just so every page is just full of this stuff that I, I, I didn't think to do that. I didn't think to do that. So I, I talked to Jay at least every couple of weeks. Uh, and he's, he's been an advisor for quite a while. And uh, what, uh, what Jay said, he said, Dave, um, you are the best person I've met at naming in the last 20 years. Like, can I have a few friends call you to name their things? Right. And uh, you know, I helped uh, Neil Strauss name his podcast and things like that. Why? I didn't train in naming. I don't have a degree in marketing. Like, like what the hell? It's because when, when someone says a name to me, I don't pay any attention to what I think about it. None. I just go, how does it hit right here? How, how does it land? And then you think about it. And this is the trick. Every line in that email you send, everything on your squeeze page, everything on your label, it had better land emotionally first and then cognitively. And most people write all of their digital content cognitively first and they either ignore or deprecate the emotional impact of it. And it's, it's done backwards. So when you, when you do that, you can't do it unless you have the wiring to feel the words. And most of us, especially men, especially entrepreneurial scrappy men, many of whom have dealt with bullying, which is why they're scrappy <laughs> or just bad parenting. Right here. Um, yeah, I was bullied a lot. Uh, and what ends up happening there is you kind of turn off or dim that and the best copywriters feel the words, then they think about the words. So for digital marketers, potato chips and diet Coke and bad fats stop you from being able to feel the words. So then you cannot do this. And that's why the physical side becomes the digital side. We really aren't very good at feeling. And to your point, if you can't feel you can't really sell. Well, there's, there's such or, a rich, Or you have to get lucky to, to sell. Yeah, there you go. You can be lucky to sell. And there's, there's a rich tapestry of feelings. And, and what happens, and, and this is part of what, what I teach at, at 40 Years of Zen, is that there's a hierarchy of feelings. And the one that's actually the, the least useful uh, and probably the, the lowest vibration, if you believe in vibration as a metric, is apathy, right? So when you're like defeated, you're like, I just don't give a crap anymore. Like I'm, I'm done, right? And, and this, that's the furthest away from, you know, joy and happiness, right? But then you peel that away. You're like, oh, then I've got um, anger uh, or shame, right? And then I've got um, fear, right? And then after that, once you work through all those things, then you have happiness or joy, which is always there at the middle of kind of the Russian nesting doll. So a lot of the times people are stuck either in apathy or in anger, right? So I'm pissed off. That person says something I don't like, therefore they're a bad person. You're like, I thought we lived in a country where we had uh, free speech and anyone was allowed to say something you didn't, you didn't agree with. And it didn't mean they're a bad person. It just means you didn't agree. And it's like, we've lost that because people are just too triggered and too fearful and angry. And when you have that going on as a, as a digital marketer, like that's not a good place to be because you're not going to get to that middle nugget where like, oh, this is how happiness, this is what happiness feels like. This is how I turn it on, right? Here's how I work my way through these other emotions so that then when you sit down and you write copy for someone, you can say this product brings you this feeling. But if you don't know the feeling and you don't know the nuances of it and you can't help them get through whatever their fear is or their anger is. Anyone who's studied the art of copywriting understands very viscerally. Wait, are you addressing fears? Are you addressing anger as you do this? Are you chipping away at those things so you can get through the armor and the firewalls to get to the joy that's in the middle so that they'll associate that with what you're doing? You are. But if you haven't done that work yourself, you're not going to be able to navigate them very well in your writing, in your videos, and all the other stuff you do. That's why you have to do the work. The other reason you have to do the work, and the reason that I started that ridiculous neuroscience thing, is that if you've done the work, 
you will find very clearly that it is unethical and it feels bad to sell garbage as if it's good. And at Wharton, they taught me this. They said, hey, here's a mathematical study. They love math at that school um, where we can show it's cheaper to spend a dollar on marketing to tell someone that your product is good than it is to make the product good. Therefore, you should spend more money on marketing and less money on product. And if you pay attention to what I've done at Bulletproof, oh yeah, <laughs> like there's a priority. There's actually an order of operations. Like number one, how are you going to feel after you eat or drink something I make? That's what I care about most. And number two, how does it taste? Because no one's going to do things that taste bad forever. That's why kale is just a bad bet. Kale's gross. And then the, the third thing I care about is convenience because I think your time and energy are worth something to you right? And the fourth thing is what's the impact on the world? Because I feel like most people are willing to spend an extra cent or two if we can have less of an impact on the world that's negative and a more of a positive one. And then how much does it cost? So are you going to spend 10 or 20% more to get all those benefits? Yes. And if not, you're not my customer and that's okay. But that's not what they teach you. But you can't turn that on its head and say, I'm going to sell hydrogenated fat, you know, corn syrup, corn oil, soybean oil, and some food coloring uh, as kids food, right? I'm, I'm just going to go do that. No, if you have consciousness, you can't because it's wrong, right? And so if you're in digital marketing, it, like either you're an entrepreneur because you're solving a problem that hasn't been solved before doing it better, or you're an entrepreneur because you stole someone else's content, you stole someone else's idea, you did a crappier job of it, and you're going to use some digital marketing and go live on an island for a little bit of money. And if you're one of those people, you should just like go bury yourself underwater until you drowned, or you should do your personal development work to realize you don't have to do that to make money. You can actually make money without stealing. You can make money by giving back to the world. And and digital marketers learn with data and science and stuff like what you teach, how to get past people's resistance to get them to do things. If you use that power for darkness to get people to buy crap that's bad for them, to get people to do things that's against their best interest or the world's best interest, like, I'm sorry, you're going to hell, whatever your version of hell is. So do the personal development work, figure out, wait, that's not okay. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use this power as a digital marketer to go do something that matters. You're going to get paid either way. Like, like it's free. <laughs> so go do that. That would be my biggest ask. You ought to develop your own personal brand if you want that. And so what I did is I developed the Bulletproof brand where it stands on its own. And I've done, you know, those things where you have two-way mirrors and you get to look at people and they're seeing your product and all. And right. it's illuminating because some people are like, oh yeah, you know, I listen to Dave's podcast. He's great. And, you, and I remember this one guy's like, I'm pretty sure that guy invented keto, right? But like, no, I didn't invent keto. I just <laughs> popularized keto. Keto was invented, you know, the year I was born probably by, by Atkins. And before that, there was a, another generation. So... Um, that said, you realize there's a bunch of people who know the brand who don't know me. And I will tell you, if you put all of your money into your own brand, you're, you're going to get screwed, right? And okay. here's why. If you really want to make money, you're not going to make money in digital marketing. You're going to make money selling your company. <laughs> and those are the big bucks. This is the, you can buy a yacht or have a house in multiple right. countries kind of money, right? You're like, yeah, this is great. I'm doing a million dollars a year. There's a lot of companies do a million dollars a year. You know how many companies do a hundred million dollars a year in revenue? About 17,000 in the US, right? So maybe you can get there someday, but even then, how much are you going to get paid, right? By the time you raise enough money, do enough things, you'll be making a pretty good salary, but probably not world changing, Right. And then when you get a company that's a certain size, even if you're doing 5 million a year in revenue, you sell that company for a 4X multiple, you just put $20 million in your pocket. You don't have to work again ever. Right. So if your name is tied to your company, you cannot exit. You can't do that. So what you want to do is you want to build your brand and you want to build your company brand so that there's an association. And the master of this is Richard Branson, right? right. You got Virgin Records, uh, records, what are records? You have to be like over 35 to know about that. Um, and uh, you've got, you know, Virgin Atlantic and Virgin Space and Virgin, probably Virgin Breakfast Sandwiches somewhere, I have no idea. But that works. And you can do the same thing, Elon Musk, you know, oh, it's SpaceX, oh, and Tesla, right? So we, we have examples of that at the very big end. Um, at the low end, 
you know, some of the things I do, some people don't know that I started and I run 40 years of Zen and some people do. And some people, most people know I started Bulletproof, but they know it stands for something. So I would tell anyone who's doing this, your brand is something you can use to put a spark behind the brands you build as a digital marketer, but find a cool name for what you're building and understand if you do it right, you can take that company and you can have investors in that company. You can sell that company. But if it's you and you get hit by a bus or, you know, someone does a deep fake of you doing something and whatever, like, like people, they, there's crazy stuff happening right now. And I think you want to have an iron in both fires would be my, my strongest piece of advice for long-term wealth creation as an entrepreneur. Well, thank you for validating my strategy of building Jeff Lerner's social brand and Entre Institute as a standalone brand um, that's trying to disrupt yeah. education, business That's education. what you've got to do. You, yeah. you nailed it. Otherwise, um, you're really putting yourself at big risk. And entrepreneurs, man, we love risk, right? So you make a million bucks. Uh, and I can say that really casually, right? Because everyone who's listening has made a million bucks, right? Of course. Uh, has anybody but, not made a million dollars? I mean, geez. <laughs> but but it, it's like you make a million bucks and everyone here wants to is why I'm saying that. And what you're most likely to do is say, this is great. Now I have a little bit of extra money. I'm just going to take, you know, 50 grand and invest it in this risky venture and take 50 grand in this risky adventure. And I did that in my 20s or when I lost my $6 million, right? Um, and the reason you do that is because that's how you make money. But what you find out is how you keep money is totally different. Just like if you hired a bunch of people just like you, you wouldn't have a good company. You need to hire people with complementary skill sets. Sure. So that's something else that, that's worth talking about. As you become more successful, the way you stay successful is via that portfolio management sort of thing. And you hire someone who's more conservative than you to help you manage a bucket of cash that's not in your business and start another business, invest or something. But a lot of people go from zero to a million back to zero and they bounce around like I did when I was younger because you didn't realize that the way you keep it isn't how you do it. There's a book called Beyond a Million. Um, by a guy named Jim Dew that talks about that. But for people in digital marketing, it's not that hard to build a company that does a quarter million dollars a year in revenue and throws off more than you would have made in your last job. It's, it, it's still yeah. hard, but it's not that hard, right? And once you get up there, you're like, whoa, wait, everything is shifting around. All of a sudden I have, you know, some extra cash and I'm hoping you're not dumb enough to go out and, you know, buy a, a Lamborghini with your first windfall. That's not what you're supposed to do but that, that diversification into different brands, to different companies, and it takes some risk off the table so that you can take care of yourself and your family it creates a feeling of safety. A feeling of safety creates better ability to feel your emotions, which mm -hmm. equals better ability to write copy. Like it, it all ties together. I run an ecosystem where we have thousands of people sort of planting their flag and saying, I want to become an entrepreneur. There's a, that's actually like the hardest thing for people in general. It just seems, you know, is to like go from, I clock in, I get paid by the hour, I get told what to mm -hmm. do. I, you know, I, I need permission or I need to be told I'm doing a good job to extreme ownership. It's all on my shoulders. It just seems like maybe there's, you know, for every hundred men, there's like eight of eight men that are able, that are, that are feel confident doing that, but then like only two women, but it's still 90% of either gender that don't. Right. Um, I think there's definitely, there's definitely a barrier to that entry because you know, we say we want to step out of all that structure, but really what we need when we step into entrepreneurship is structure, right? Yeah. We, we have all those expectations on us. We know what we're supposed to do. We know what's going on. We get into entrepreneurship and it's like, hold on a minute. I'm running every department all of a sudden. I'm trying to do all the things. I'm not sure where to focus. And we run ourselves ragged. So it's understandable that people feel uneasy when they step into entrepreneurship. We, we romanticize it and we think, oh, I'm going to be on my laptop by the pool. And the truth is, who wants to be at the pool with your laptop? Close the laptop and be at the pool when you're right. at the pool, right? Be at work when you're ready to be at work. And so that's part of what I teach people how to do. How do you create that structure in your business how, without it being stifling, right? For me... Productivity is like the bones in your body. It's, you know, your bones in your body don't tell you to run, skip, hop, or jump, but they allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what good productivity does is it gives you structure for your days so that you can fully expand into your full potential. And that's what is really powerful about creating that focus, creating those ways of maximizing your, your success through structure make a huge difference. 
So I have uh, almost 10 years ago, my, my, I met my wife. Well, I met my wife a little over 10 years ago. Um, and she had three kids at the time, single mom, who I've now adopted. And then we, we've added a fourth. And so anyway, the point being on like day one, when I showed up and I was like, hey, I want to be your boyfriend. And I would love if it, to help you raise these kids if you're open. We were like, OK, but we're going to therapy because kids are at play and we're not going to screw. Like, it's fine if we screw screw up. We're adults, but like we're not going to screw right. up the kids. Right. So we were in therapy on day one. I'm like a therapy junkie. I love therapy. And my therapist said in total seriousness on day one, he said, I give this piece of advice to every one of my new patients. Not many take it, but he said, go get a henna tattoo, something you can keep attached to you as long as you need it that says structure is my best friend. Mm -hmm. And he's like, structure's liberation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's like, and, and you know, now we have Jocko Willing saying discipline equals freedom, right? I mean, it's all the same message, but, but that idea of structure is as the great uh, un unlocker of human potential. I mean, we're on a show called Unlock Your Potential, right? I, I don't think there's a single bigger thing that you can install in your life to unlock your potential than, than better structure. So tell me, how did you get so obsessed with structure? How'd you get so good at it? And what is like kind of the, the, the core of your framework for helping people improve it? Yeah. Well, you know, I truly believe that structure is what liberates us. It allows us the freedom to do the things that we want to do. I started my first business in 2008 with $50. And it was supposed to be a side business. It was supposed to be this little side thing that I did that I wasn't going to grow it. I was a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, was didn't have a website selling to friends, maybe, maybe friends of friends. That was it <laughs> at the most. And that might be stretching it. And I had a conversation with my husband uh, who was on the other side of the planet. He would travel for three or four weeks at a time. He'd buy a ticket called the Around the World Ticket. And he did mm -hmm. marketing for Fortune 500 companies at the time. So he would travel and he'd go to Asia and uh, you know Australia and all these different places. And uh, I had a conversation with him telling him all the things that the kids were doing and what was going on. And he said, I'm missing everything. I'm missing all the milestones. I'm missing all the moments. I'm missing all the things. And I'm like, no, 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 you're not. But I hung up the phone and I made a decision that night, standing in my bright yellow kitchen. I decided I was going to grow my business for $50 to the point where I could absorb my husband's MBA income and he could come work alongside of me and we would have the lifestyle freedom that we really wanted. And so that night I sat down and I mapped out strategies. I put the kids to bed. Like maybe I rushed them to bed. I don't think I even made them brush their teeth. I was like, go to bed. <laughs> right? rushed downstairs and I started mapping out systems. I started mapping out organization. How was I going to make this work? Because I was a mom with two small children who were literally playing at my feet on a daily basis, uh, who had a husband who traveled for three or four weeks at a time. So I knew that I had to really create these strong pockets of focus, that I needed to create systems for myself so I could bring people on. And so I mapped it all out. And within about a year, I was able to make my goal happen, to have him come work alongside of me. So he left corporate America in 2009 and I grew my business and, you know, it was great. It was wonderful. But I was doing all this work with all these women, talking to them about how they grow their businesses. And I realized nobody had the structure that I had, that I just naturally knew this is one of my gifts, right? Was being able to be productive. And so I ended up closing that first business and deciding to open up Inkwell Press, which is really the three things I'm most passionate about. Teaching, I used to be a teacher in my last life, uh, empowering women and productivity because I knew productivity is what allowed me the freedom lifestyle that I wanted. Lifestyle freedom, time freedom, financial freedom, even location freedom. We moved to where we wanted to, we moved to where we wanted to retire when we were you know, years and years away from retirement right. because why not? We run our own business. And so, for me, it was really this realization that other people aren't running their businesses this way. That's crazy because I had, even when it was just me running the business, I had departments and I had different days where I themed, you know, Monday was for marketing. So marketing Mondays and I put on my marketing hat and I focused only on marketing on Mondays. Tuesdays was for, you know, innovation. Tuesdays was for operations. Wednesday was for shipping. And so really compartmentalizing that and allowing myself the laser focus instead of trying to do all the different things on a daily basis, really zoning in and getting that focus allowed me to work. And I was working literally at that point, maybe two days a week, 
Maybe because I worked on the days my kids were at preschool and Mother's Day out. And mm. then, you know, I continued to, as then when they went to school, I, I ramped it up and started doing, you know, spending more time on it. But productivity is what allowed me to, to take my CEO of the office hat off and wear my CEO of the home hat at three o'clock. I don't work and I still don't work after three o'clock most days, unless I make an exception um, because it's something that I want to do or something that's important. And I don't work on Fridays. I work four days a week and I get off work Monday through Thursday at three o'clock and I run a seven figure company because I have structure, because I use productivity to my advantage, not trying to do a thousand things, mm -hmm. doing the things that are truly important. You all need to hear this, that Tanya with $50, a husband who's gone more than he's home, kids that she's taking care of, you've scaled a seven figure company because, because not because you're better or smarter, no, or, or although you may mm -hmm. be those things, but because you are more organized. Basically. I like to say, you know, I'm not special. My mom, yes, thinks I'm special. My husband thinks I'm special, but I'm really not special in that I have anything that anybody else doesn't have, honestly. So if I can do this, I truly believe, and I know that anybody can do it. And what was that it's business? Just, what was the first business? My first business, it's very niche, very specific. So um, I was, and this will kind of date with me how old I am. Uh, so it was 2008 and we didn't really have smartphones with pictures of our kids. And people would ask me all the time for pictures. Oh, let me see the pictures of the kids. I'd be like, listen, you're lucky I showered today. Like I don't have pictures of my kids. Right. So <laughs> I ended up deciding I wanted to put pictures of my kids on pieces of jewelry that uh, then I would have it with me all the time, like necklaces, bracelets, things like that. And you know, my friends started buying it, which was why I had the $50. And then I decided, you know, in that moment, you know what, I'm going to niche in on this. I'm going to really be specific. I'm going to niche in and I'm going to sell to photography studios. So I'm going to work with professional photographers and they're going to resell my jewelry to their clients. So that's what I did. I, I created photo jewelry uh, with these really high-end photography studios and, uh, that's, that's what I, what I started off doing, but I had a moment to be honest with you in about 2013, where I looked at my husband and I said, I love you. I love working with you, but I don't love what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't truly what I was passionate about. It fit the need of, of, you know, okay, I want to scale this business. And, and, and so if you don't mind me asking, it, how big did that yeah. business scale? Uh, it was six figures. That one didn't okay. get to seven figures. Um, but, but still, as a, as a single place. owner operator of a multiple six figure business, you're making oh, a big time uh, yeah. Fortune 500 the, salary. Equivalent. Yeah, I was yeah. making more than yeah, more than a Fortune 500 salary. Yeah, and so it was it was wonderful. It was great, and because it was jewelry, it was small. I ran it out of my house, and, and I and literally it, only worked on days that the kids were at preschool. And the so reason I'm was, leaning into the, these details, forgive me, is because I just think a lot of times, and again, uh, for an entrepreneurial. Uh, or aspirationally entrepreneurial audience, a lot of times they over convolute what it means to be a successful entrepreneur. You oh, can yeah. run we, a we half a million dollar year business things. and have an incredible life. Well, the truth is, and, and this is the God's honest truth. I've met business owners who run $32 million companies who are only making 32,000 in profit. <laughs> so, you know, we look at those numbers a lot of times. We think, oh, it's super flashy. What's your take home? What's your overhead, right? Mm -hmm. What are the real metrics you need to be looking at? So yeah, I was a six-figure business, but I had no overhead at right. all, right? right? And what was great is when I just made the decision to, to close up that company, open up Inkwell Press, I had this whole backpack of knowledge that I took with me, right? All this information, all the things that I wasn't going to do again, all the things I wanted to do again, all the things I had learned. And I was able to scale Inkwell Press when I opened it up. I scaled it to seven figures in 18 months. And I had three employees, me, my husband, and one other person. And we got to seven figures in 18 months. Yeah. It really is about creating the structure. And it's not about taking more time. You know, we think that we want to, but productivity is about doing more. Productivity isn't about doing more. It's doing what's most important. It's looking at your life. It's looking at your business and figuring out what are the things that move the needle, right? What are the things that are making the biggest impact? And then focusing your time, your energy, your money in those areas, because it's going to make the biggest difference. But when I first started, uh, to keep the overhead low, we literally had pallets delivered to the front yard. And then I brought them in and they were in a spare bedroom in my basement. 
I mean, you do what you have to do when you're starting off, you know, yeah. you got to be scrappy. You have to. And when we just made the decision to close the one business and open up Inkwell Press, we went six months without any income. My husband works for me. So if I closed one business, we had no money coming in. Mm -hmm. So we had to tighten our belts and we had to really think about how are we going to make this work? Um, and so that's what we did. We ran it out of our house for a year and then we moved to a bigger warehouse and we had a warehouse and then we moved to two, two warehouses that are now side by side. Uh, so it's one of those things where I think a lot of people, when they step into entrepreneurship, they think they're immediately going to need to go to the two warehouses. You start small, you start with what you can and it grows from there. You're learning lessons the whole way and you're figuring out how to structure it. And I think that's the thing for me is even when I only had three employees, even when I was running most of the operations in the business, I was always creating manuals. I was always creating processes so that when it was time to scale up, I could easily hand those over and delegate it to somebody else. So have you always been real sort of, you know, fastidious or kind of obsessed with documentation and process and systems, or is this totally an acquired skill? I would say it's, it's probably something that I've always loved. Like I'm, yeah. I, I can, I love watching, like I'll watch things on um, the Amazon warehouses, right? I'll watch right. how the Amazon warehouses do fulfillment. And I'm like, okay, what, what can I apply to what I'm doing? And mm -hmm. I'll break it down because I'm, I'm not interested in being Amazon, but how are they doing it? Oh, they've got these, this bin system. Okay. I'm going to do a bin system. Okay. How are they, how are they moving things through the shipping area through fulfillment? Our fulfillment is like tight. Mm -hmm. We ship incredibly fast with, you know, very little margin of error for a very small company. I mean, we still don't have very many team members because mm -hmm. we don't need it. I think people get caught up too. And like, I need a big team. You don't need a big team. You don't need a lot of capital. I mean, I started with $50, right? You don't need a big team. You don't need a lot of the things that we think looks really good. We don't need the fancy office that we see on Pinterest. Yeah. What you need is to focus in on what's going to really move the needle. And then as you grow, you start adding those things on. Uh, my first 150 episodes of my podcast, I recorded in my closet for crying out loud, right? And it was a top, top, you know, productivity podcast. It was nationally ranked and <laughs> iTunes noteworthy and all those things. And I was recording in my, in my closet because it was like, I'm, I'm not going to do, you know, I'm not ready to go to a studio. I'm not ready to spend the money on this. Mm -hmm. I want to spend my money on that in my business. And it evolves and it grows. It really is what is most important to you. One of the exercises I go through when I, when I work with entrepreneurs is let's redefine what success looks like to you. I think so often we define success because we look left and right and see what everybody else is doing. And we're like, oh, I need to be doing what he's doing over here. I need to do what she's doing over here. And we're setting the wrong goals. We're setting the wrong metrics. We're setting the wrong expectations for everything. So it's really, what, do you, what, is, what does success look like to you? So I do this exercise where we, we go through one year in the future, five years in the future, 10 years in the future, 20. And we talk about you outside of work. What do your relationships look like at this point in your life? One year down the road, five years down the road, and so on. What, do, uh, what, is, what is your living situation look like? What does your recreational life look like? What are all these things, right? Like this holistic version of you. Okay, now let's figure out how much money you need to have that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Then, so a lot of times we start with that financial part, like how much money do I need to make? Well, hold on. How much money do you really need to make for the lifestyle? Your business is not the end all be all. Your business is a vehicle for the lucrative life. It's what allows you to live the lucrative life. So let's figure out what the lucrative life looks like for you in these, you know, increments of one year, mm -hmm. five year, and so on. And then let's work backwards. All right. Now we know how much money we need to make. This is how much profit we need to make. So then how much do we want to make revenue wise? And then we just go from there. And then we start mapping out goals that are based off these things. Instead of just throwing darts at a dartboard, we need to really be intentional about the goals we're setting and the metrics we're setting. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of with on purpose is I've never seen a book that helps you understand what your goal should be. You know, there's, there's no list. There's no magic list of you need to do this and then that and then this. Mm. It's really customizing them and figuring out what your goals should look like for you, for your idea of success. And so I walk through a whole process in the book of how you back that up into what your goal should be. So like, as you were explaining that, which is just so like magically simple, really, when you put it in those terms, it's like, oh, 
my dream life would cost me, you know, 15 grand a month, right? So great. You need 180 yeah. grand a year. You need a 20% margin on a $900,000 a year business, which means you need to make $75,000 a month in gross revenue, which means you need to figure out how to sell $100 of a 100 units of a per month yeah. of a or a thousand units a month of a $75 product. So that's 30 a day. Yeah. And then you can even keep working backwards. If you're, you know, your main offering, your key, key service or mm-hmm. uh, offer or whatever it is, is a, is a hundred dollars. You want to make this much money. All right. How many leads do you need to get in? Okay. Right. If your close rate is one out of four, then, then you can start working backwards. And then you're working with numbers that really matter yeah. because they're connected to that lifestyle that you're looking for. But so often we're just like, I need more. I need more money. I need more leads. I need more marketing. I need to spend more money on my ads. I need, we're not really right. being intentional with our focus on how we're growing the business. And it's that intentionality that allows you to do less while you're making so much more yeah. money. And I think people also sometimes miss that when it's all connected back to your real reason why you want to do it, yes. it's so much easier to find the time and energy to do the work. Oh, You're just yeah, naturally it's inspired naturally, to do it. Yeah. It's baked in already because you you know what it's connected to. You know, there's this very real, very measurable drop in happiness and life satisfaction when you accomplish a goal. It's called the goal setting paradox. It's really kind of fascinating. And the reason why we experience that is because we think there's this magical moment when we cross the finish line of whatever that goal is. When I make six figures in my business, then I'll be happy. When I get my first client, then I'm going to be happy. When I, whatever it is, right? But the truth is you get there and that happens and you're like, oh, now what? I don't know what to do. So you feel unsettled. But if you connect what you're doing to that big, bright future, that vision you have of where it is you want to go, that becomes a stepping stone. Oh, this is amazing. I did this. I know what I'm going to do next, right? And so you take a moment to celebrate and then you're off and running for the next thing because it's created a springboard. It's created momentum because it is all connected Mm -hmm. and it's connected to what is important to you, what your idea of success is, what your life should look like because it's what you want and your family wants. Yeah. So let me ask this. What is the joy of missing out? Yeah, the joy of missing out is really actively choosing to miss out, to say no to more things instead of feeling like you need to do everything. I think we get really caught up in this idea that hashtag all the things, right? I need to do all the things. I want to do all the things. And I truly believe that happiness is our birthright, that there is joy and happiness in the cracks and crevices of our everyday life. And when you actively choose to miss out on all the other noise, that's when you can find happiness on a daily basis. It really is, you know, at the heart of the joy of missing out, the heart of anything I teach, uh, it's what I call small, huge movements. So simple to do, easy to implement, yet monumental in the impact it can make in your daily life. Little tiny tweaks to find that joy on a daily basis. And a lot of it comes through having good productivity, having good structure so that you can truly enjoy what you're doing. That's why we go into business to enjoy what we're doing, right? So why are you doing things you don't like? Yeah, it's kind of a, it kind of feels like, you know, what we say a lot in our world is that good is the enemy of great. And there's all these Mm -hmm. good things. There's so many good things to say yes to. Yeah. But But the few great things won't be there unless you actually say no to a lot of good things. Yeah. Well, every time we say yes, we're saying no to something else. So every time we say yes to an opportunity or yes to, you know, a project, we're saying no to something else. And oftentimes what we're saying no to are our own passion projects, Mm -hmm. our own priorities, our family, our free time, right? We're saying no to those things because we're worried about making sure that we're doing all the things. And I can tell you, when you choose to do fewer, you'll do them better and you'll feel more excited about it. Can you kind of explain essentialism, the the book, but also just the idea? Essentialism is contrasted to non-essentialism. You can be an essentialist or a non-essentialist. And often we, you know, jump between the two. But what non-essentialists think, what they do, what they get is completely different than essentialists. A non-essentialist 
basically believes that everything's essential. They have to try, therefore, to do everything all the time reactively. Uh, they, they fall into what Jim Collins has called the undisciplined pursuit of more. And as a result, they don't get what's on the packaging. They don't actually achieve everything they want to achieve. What happens is they burn out without, uh, without getting the results they want. They tend to uh, feel out of control. They're not even sure if the most important things uh, got done today, uh, lying in bed at the end of the day. They've done all these different things, but they feel like, well, my to-do list is longer now than it was at the beginning of the day. And I, I just don't have the sense of satisfaction. You know, So it's a sort of a, an unsatisfying way to live. Uh, the essentialist is in contrast to this and is counter-cultural. Uh, what they believe, the mindset that they're looking at the world through is less but better, that only a few things are essential and almost everything is uh, trivial noise. And so what they do differently is that they pursue, well, it's a disciplined pursuit of less. Uh, they're constantly trying to select just the most important things from the trivial many. They're eliminating as much of the non-essential as possible. They're creating systems to make effort, uh, execution as effortless as possible. Uh, and so as a result, they're living a life that matters. Uh, they're having more joy in the journey. They know confidently the right things are getting done every day. And, and so this is the contrast, right? What they see, what they do, what they get is really different. And, and it seems to have had resonance and uh, the power of relevancy for people. And I would say that's increased over the last uh, year and a half. So one of the the terms that I've heard uh, when I, I've read read some, you know, like reviews and, and summaries and such about uh, essentialism, and then you just use the term uh, I think you used the term, the trivial many. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I hired my first business coach back in 2009, I want to say. And one of the very first things exercises we did was separating the vital few from the trivial many. Is, <laughs> is, is, that, is, that vernac is that a vernacular that's just out there in the world? Or are those your terms that, the, that have kind of become almost memes in, in professional development? Um, I... I think that uh, the, the vital few and trivial many are, is language originally from the efficiency, um, you know, contributors and thinkers uh, when, when people were really, uh, you know, the very first, before you had management consulting as you do today, you had sort of these efficiency experts and they were using a scientific approach to try and improve quality. So it was part of the first quality improvement movements okay. that, that were largely ignored in the United States. Uh, but but were found a receptive audience in in uh, in Japan, and I mean just carrying this through, the, the, you know, at the time we don't really remember this now, but it, it, Japanese products at that time were known for being cheap but low quality. Uh, it may be similar, which again is a bit of a stereotype, but similar as you might have with you know made in China still right, is, right. Well, it's cheap, but it might not be as, as as high quality. That's of course changing, but. But suddenly, Japan, when they were embraced this, this quality movement of saying, look, basically, the, the, what they discovered, the, these experts, was that if you could improve just the right few things, you didn't have to try to improve everything. But if you could find the right few problems and address them, the vital few things, you could massively increase quality without massively increasing cost. And, and as I say, in the U.S., it was like, ah, we're not really bothered with all of this. We're sort of leading in all, the, leading in the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the car economy and, and, and uh, in a whole variety of air, industries. So there was no sort of pain point. But in Japan, there was a great pain point. And they embraced it. And this is how, how it literally shifted Japan into becoming, at one time, the second largest economy in the world, uh, known for its quality all around the world, suddenly taking over uh, the car industry globally. It all came back to this single idea. So... This idea, this, 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 you know, less but better uh, is something that can revolutionize economies, uh, societies. And, and of course, what I'm focused on is, is how it can revolutionize the quality of someone's life mm -hmm. uh, and their relationships and their fall from their, their teams and their business and so on. So that term, uh, you know, when you said that, I thought, OK, is that's that's basically lean manufacturing is kind of I think that I, that thing that source for, I think, Toyota. And I, I forget the story, but some, there was some American guy that went over there and learned all about it and brought it back. Um, and then there's this concept of Kaizen um, that I, I think is pretty interlinked. Is that, that's pretty much what you're talking about. Is that 
that movement. And I'm not speaking about with any authority because I don't have it, but. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you're exactly right still. Uh, and so eventually after, after it was transformative, you know, within Japan, it was then, you know, a little paradoxically outsourced back into, uh, into American manufacturers uh, that suddenly were saying, okay, there is a different way of doing this. And mm -hmm. so by that point it became known. I mean, Toyota was certainly one of the most famous uh, companies for this. Uh, and and it, it, the Toyota way became significant, and and I don't know. This is a little getting a little meta, but but Toyota actually started themselves to fall into, literally fall into what Jim Collins has called the undisciplined pursuit of more. So his analysis, where he used that language, is he was studying great companies that were falling from their greatness. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, in a book that was uh, the, the, probably the least read of, of, of Jim's books, uh, but, but I, I really love it. And it's, it's called How the Mighty Fall. He identifies five phases that, that once successful, once great companies go in, mm. and Discipline Pursuit of More is one of them. But there's a, the, it goes on in stage four is where you're, uh, you're, you're suddenly grasping for salvation because you suddenly become aware, oh, we have a problem but we don't know what to do about it. And quite famously, the CEO of Toyota, this is a few years ago now, uh, but, but wrote to his own employees saying, we are at stage four as a mm. company. And it was his, I mean, in part, his attempt as a wake-up call, but maybe it was also just you know, him stating reality as he saw it. But, but this is sometimes the risk of, of you know, success. Success can become a catalyst for failure. Uh, because it, it often masks problems that are happening under the surface. And I observed this myself in Silicon Valley companies, and they, they seemed to go through a predictable pattern that they would be focused in the first phase, and then that would lead to success, and the success would breed so many options and opportunities that they would start to plateau in their progress or fail altogether, because they, you know, like success breeds so many options that that it, you, you become disfocused, it undermines the very things that led to success. Well, that was a pattern I noticed, I call it the, the paradox of success, uh, but I didn't just notice it in companies, I also noticed it in individuals within those companies, that we individually can start taking on so many things that we start to feel, well, we wouldn't say plateauing in our progress, we wouldn't use that language, but, but people start to feel busy, but not necessarily productive. Uh, they feel stretched too thin at work or at home. They feel like their life is turned into something where, where they're just constantly hijacked by other people's agenda for them. Mm -hmm. and, and all of this is a, a personalized example of this business uh, phenomenon. Uh, and, and that's something I think people, you know, everywhere seem to be, uh, be able to relate to now. So was that, was that the impetus for the book was to take these, you know, what were, were fundamentally business principles and try to bring them into the essence of individual life? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I, the, the place I play uh, is sort of where business meets personal. Uh, and so I work, continue to work with uh, you know, basically all of the major tech companies, but also across industries now. I'll work with organizations. Uh, but what, I, what I'm always drawn to is ideas that can work at whatever level of, of, of human application you want to apply them to. Mm -hmm. so, so you can apply them. I mean, actually, it's more than just a thought experiment. These ideas, if they're true ideas about how human flourishing and failure work, then it can work at the societal level. It can work at the organizational, team level, interpersonal level, personal level, or even intrapersonal level, right? So within, so I'm always interested, that's a, a, I don't often describe or talk about this, but I'm always interested at finding something that works at every extrapolation and yeah. that it remains true. Uh, and so I, I find it, you know, I find it especially fascinating where you can see things that run like a th gold thread through all of it. And so somebody can then apply it at any level they want once they have the mindset they can say, okay, well, how do I apply this to just me and my life? How can I apply it to my relationships, my teams, my business, and so on? Uh, and essentialism is a, is a, is a you know, a, a, in pursuit of that kind of application, and, and so is effortless as well. But, you know, both books are trying to say this is something that applies 
you know, the full spectrum, uh, the full stack of, of human experience. Mm-hmm. Well, I, uh, I, feel, I feel right at home. There, that's an interesting statement you made because I, I find myself doing that a lot. Um, where I'm trying to take, because I, I, you know, my work, I teach entrepreneurship and I, and I teach entrepreneurialism, which I don't think are the same thing. Mm-hmm. One's a, you know, a, a vocation and one's a philosophy, if you will. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, what I'm always, what I'm really interested, I mean, even the name of this show, what I'm interested in is unlocking human potential. And I, I just happen right. to think that entrepreneurship is a great crucible in which to do that. But I'm yeah. always looking for ideas, like you're saying, that you know, kind of these uni- like unified field ideas that work at the macro and the micro. Um, and, and, and even like, like I li- I'm, li- I'm listening to a book right now on like quantum, quantum physics. Yes. Because there's these things that happen in little tiny scales that, uh, that are, are like, I think, really profound truths about human right. existence. And I'll share one of my little kind of casual examples. The, the Heisenberg, only because you're the only other person I've ever talked to who said the same thing about finding yeah. these ideas that scale right. through all levels of human experience. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that you cannot simultaneously measure the location and the momentum of a particle. And so, <laughs> you know, if you, if, you, if you take a snapshot of the momentum of a particle, in other words, its trajectory and its acceleration, it creates a wave uh, f- a equation that makes for variable location. But if you try to, if you actually quantize the location, it creates a wave uh, formula that creates variable momentum. Right. So, and I actually think that's how we are, that if we actually right. try to stop and figure out where we are in time and space, we lose momentum. And right. it's actually more important to be focused on our momentum and our trajectory and our acceleration. And, and that actually gives us almost kind of a stoicism about the present because it doesn't matter. It's only about where we're headed. So- Anyway, that's an example, but yeah, but it's so fun, right? Because all truth can be circ- circumscribed into one great whole, so it's all interrelated, mm-hmm. and and so and so I f- I find it endlessly fascinating, uh, you know, to be able to try and connect the dots. I'm I'm doing some new research now um, that uh, that that has you know has me absolutely fascinated, and it's it's seeing the world through a particular lens and and rediscovering everything through that lens. Essentialism did that by saying. Look, what if you looked at the world through only those things that are most important? In the book Effortless, I'm trying to do that by saying, look, what if you looked at the world through the lens of how can how can I make these things? How am I making everything harder than it needs to be? Mm-hmm. The phenomenon of over overthinking and over complicating and over straining and forcing things, and and it's an error that people make who are part of the hit squad, right? The hardworking, intelligent, talented group of people, they're going to have a set of errors that are different to people who, who could be typified, you know, and I, I don't really like to typify anyone this way, but maybe someone who's kind of more lazy or more, more hesitant to take action, they're going to have a different set of problems. Mm-hmm. So it, but, but, but a successful set of problems doesn't make it less of a problem. You still have to figure out how to be successful at success and so, so effortless is a, an attempt at that, and I think it has relevance because, because successful people have dealt with the last 18 months in, predictably, in a predictable set of ways. So they have done it, you know, the highly engaged people that are on the edge of exhaustion even before the pandemic have doubled down on the assumptions that they believe will lead to greater success. And in a lot of cases, it has led to success. I mean, I'm working with CEOs all the time, literally, literally, let's say maybe double or even triple the demand of where I was at pre-pandemic. So I'm having conversations constantly with leaders who are facing this oddity of our success. We've actually had incredible results, but man, people are being burned out. And we can see people leaving that we'd rather not have leave. And we're seeing the turnover. So the results are still uh, uh, on the surface look great, but they're very concerned about, well, we can't sustain this for another 18 months. So there's a hunger for saying, how can we, how can we get breakthrough results, but without burning everybody out? Yeah. And, and that's a non-trivial problem because if you've been rewarded for harder and harder work in your life, and if you've actually got great, you know, sort of set of results over the last 18 months through pushing harder and doing more and you, 
there's no more room. You've run out of space. You're running out of energy. And yet the pressure is to still go higher. And so I think about this as, the, um, as a 10x dilemma, which is that overachievers want kind of all the time to get 10x results. But no overachiever can work 10x harder. And once you put those together, once you face that dilemma, you, 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 the reason for writing Effortless becomes self-evident. The reason for reading it becomes self-evident because you go, well, I have to find an easier, smarter, simpler, better path to better results. And I need to stop distrusting the easy just because I think hard work is a virtue doesn't mean ease, ease has to be a, a vice. You know, that, that, that easy does not equal lazy. It's like you suddenly have to open yourself up to this whole possibility and this, this, this different, I think, counterintuitive paradigm. It's counterintuitive for anyone who's an insecure overachiever, of which there are many. Yeah, let's say the majority, maybe every. I, th- I think you're probably talking to one, frankly. So I hope you don't mind <laughs> if, we, if we camp on this idea for a while because yes. I need some therapy. <laughs> yes. Well, we do, but that's the right word for it in a sense because, because – once you become a certain level of a performer, no one's talking to you about, about these subjects because, and in fact, if you listen to sort of any of the, let's say the majority of the 1980s kind of thinking, no pain, no gain, give everything, right. do more, you can kill it. Like all of that language will actually hurt your performance. It's good from zero to, to 60 but it's really bad from 60 and beyond. And so what gets you here won't get you there. But if you try to do more of what got you here, then what will end up happening is that you end up paying a great price, your price in your health. You'll be sleeping less and less and you, it, it will pri- pay a price in your most important relationships. It's absolutely predictable because they're like, man, there's nothing ever enough. And it, it just more and more and more and more time and more and more effort. We didn't matter less and less. So it damages relationships. So it burns yourself out physically, but it doesn't stop there. It burns out your relationships and it can even burn out whole companies because it's all this, you know, it's this one paradigm. I liken it sometimes to bloodletting. Right. For 3000 years. Yeah. Now, don't get me started on bloodletting. I started. I shouldn't have done. But 3000 years from 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 ancient uh, Greece. Yeah, well, Egypt originally Greece mm-hmm. came through Rome. It came into the Middle Ages, into the whole of Europe. This thing, you know, there's evidence. I didn't know this till recently. There's evidence to suggest that King Charles II was effectively killed. I'm exaggerating it, but effectively killed by bloodletting. He had a seizure and they just took 24 ounces of blood from him, weakened his whole system, so finished him off. And also George Washington. I bet you didn't know that. I've never Mm -hmm. heard that before. I've read a lot about the the, the founding fathers, but that, that was part of the complication of his treatment at the end of his life was that they they were performing bloodletting on him. Uh, and of course, this did almost no one any good. The, the, the dominant paradigm for 3,000 years and the whole time it's false, the whole time it's fake. And the same thing happens for overachievers is that they've got this narrative, this story, and, and it, it's, it's just basically it's a con. It's basically not, or at least it's an incomplete picture. It's an incomplete narrative. Mm-hmm. We have to upgrade our way of a sophistication of thinking and one of the ways we upgraded, again, surprisingly, perhaps, is by discovering simpler, easier strategies for success, just to discover that, that's, that, that those are acceptable and that they're, in fact, absolutely vital if we want to achieve our highest point of contribution. There's, there's like almost 8 billion people now in this world. How do I have an edge if it's just about not going harder than most of them are willing to? <laughs> well, there's two things to, 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 to break apart here. Okay, so the first is, is it true that putting in more effort gives you an edge over the people that don't put in more effort? And of course, it is true under some circumstances. There's lots and lots of evidence to support that. But even there, one has to be careful because you can't, just, you can't just take an example of someone who's put in massive effort, got massive results, and take from that, well, therefore, you have, if you put in massive effort, you'll get massive results. Because what it doesn't allow for is all the, all the bodies along the way. 
So you can find an entrepreneur and we, we could certainly do it together. It wouldn't take much that work 120 hour weeks kind of thing, 100 hours perpetually and so on and go, well, that's what it takes. And it's like, yeah, but I can point out for every one of those, we can find a million examples of people who started to do that. And what they actually got was in debt, broken relationships, broken health, and they didn't get written up in, you know, in the ink magazine because there's no story, there's no success. Right. Off the hook. So you have to be careful in any, any strategy one recommends. One has to look at not just the successes of that strategy, but all the people who failed pursuing the same strategy. So that's like the first thing one has to be at least wary of. And then the second thing I want to break apart from what you're saying is, is like, even if it's true that a certain message gets you, you know, off the couch, you know, and run it, get up and run. You're not running. You got to do something, right? Like, so even if a certain message gets you moving, one has to be careful about how long it is relevant for. Yeah. For example, as I work with insecure overachievers, one of the things I notice is that, well, a friend of mine pointed this out. Let me just share the story. So this is an Ernst Young Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, he was one of the first people to help create a company that uh, provided for-profit microloans. Mm-hmm. So microloan had been established, but, but they said, well, how do you scale it? And they said, well, actually, we know how to scale things. You just have to bring in the right sort of management consulting from the outside. You get the right uh, you know, uh, investors involved so you can scale it that way. And you do it for profit. That's the difference. And at first it was like seen, you know, it was being criticized, but eventually it, it just grew into like multi-billion dollars worth of this stuff. And he's traveling, he's in three continents a week. I mean, he's just like living the dream. He feels he's doing what matters and so on. And one day he, he's just asleep at night and, it, it, and he heard a gunshot go off. So he wakes up in bed, he's looking around like, what happened? And his wife's still asleep, his kids are still asleep. So he's like, okay, I guess I dream, dreamt it. A couple of days later, it happens again in the middle of the night. Then it happens a few days later in the middle of the day. And he's like, okay, something is off, right? You know, physically something's off. And it goes to the doctors and they say, they do a bunch of tests. And, and it's more complicated than this. But one of the things he said is, you, you got to sleep. You have to rest. You know, like you're pushing yourself so past the point of, of healthy renewal that it's, you know, your body's having to use up resources that, that, that it can't re- you know, recuperate from. So, you, you know, you're burning out. And so he says, he says, like as a classic overachiever, he says, I don't need six weeks like you're telling me. I'll do this in two weeks. Like I'll recover right. faster than anyone else. And so he goes home. He's like, okay, I'm going to sleep. And he was amazed to find he could sleep 16 hours a day. And at the end of two weeks, he goes, oh, I'm still not recovered. I clearly do have an issue. And he crawls back to the doctor. He's like, okay, what do I have to do? Well, what he had to do eventually was take out like a couple of years of like recovery. He had to step aside as CEO of his business. And he he just broke his heart to have to do that. And he summarized this. He's talking to a, a, a group of leaders as he was sharing this with us. And he said, I'll summarize the whole lesson this way. Protect the asset. That's the rule. You are the asset. And if you don't protect the asset, then you aren't going to be able to make the higher contribution that you want to make in the world. If you just think it's all about doing and none about recuperating, then it's a, it's a false, you know, this is not sustainable. And he added one more observation, which comes directly to your point that you were making before, which is, which is he said, if you tell an insecure overachiever to run a marathon, they know how to do that. They know how to set the target, make it happen, get going, show the progress, put it on social media, all the rest. He said, they know how to do that. If you tell an an insecure overachiever to go take a nap, they don't know how to do that. That's counter to the whole way that they've been developed and programmed. And and that's the real challenge. And so now that comes back. What you said originally, you said, said, if if, if it's not true that more effort gives you an edge, well, what is, what do we do with that? Because the whole thing's spinning upside down now. And that's my, my response to you is, is yes, there's a certain point effort will get you to. But after that, it's your ability to recuperate better than other people, to mm. keep your mind sharper and clearer than other people. It, 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 and if I put it in one rule, it would be this rule. It's don't do more today than you can recuperate fully from by tomorrow. 
And if you keep that single rule over time, then you have a tremendous competitive advantage over all those that are just overexerting. They'll burn out. They're burnouts. Maybe it won't happen in six months. Maybe it's three or four years. I mean, think, take podcasting. Here we are having podcasting. It's totally true. The number of people, I think the stats are something like only 10% of podcasts outlive three episodes. Yeah. Those that survive, only, only 10% of that lives past 20 episodes. Mm-hmm. And so there is tremendous competitive advantage in being able to maintain a consistency over time. And that's not simply a matter of more effort. It's actually a matter of, of, of building boundaries that protect our tendency to over effort things so that we're here tomorrow, you know, still here 10 years later, still here, still contributing. Mm-hmm. And so, so to me, it's a more, it's a, it's a, it's not that what you're arguing, I think is inherently wrong or always wrong. I'm not arguing that, but that there's a, a certain shelf life to it. And then you have to go discover, let's say, entrepreneurship 2.0 or 3.0 right. in order to be able to continue to make progress, but without burning out. I'd love to uh, pivot into work-life harmony. Like you, I don't love the term balance, but maybe you could talk about that shift or that evolution or that elevation, if you will. Yeah, I think, I, you know, what I personally realized when I was trying to get balance, and I think any of your listeners who are entrepreneurial or entrepreneurs know, we get into the zone, right? You have a new idea, you love the idea, and you're just laser focused on it, and then you feel the inevitable burnout, right? And so balance taught me that it's fine. If you're working hard, you just need to play hard. And so what started happening is I was just piling more and more and more on the scale to feel imbalanced. And I just felt crazy all the time, right? And I was physically not well and things were just happening. And what I started to realize with the idea of harmony, and and that went back to the first principle, the elevation approach, right? Just declutter your space. When I kind of got rid of everything and just took a look at things, I thought, okay, what I don't want is a scale I want a plate, right? And on that one plate, I want my favorite things. It's my meal. And I know when I add a flavor that works and doesn't work. And I'm not trying to stack it. I'm just trying to have the best thing. And so maybe, you know, the biggest thing on my plate really is my work. And then I start to add in the other things, but I need those other things to make the work the highlight, right? And so that that for me is the philosophy that's worked better is to say, I always want to be in harmony. And, you know, if you're doing a dissertation, if you're, you know, doing a a test of whatever it is, like there are times in life that are going to require more from us when it comes to work. That is just natural, right? Uh, Like I know a lot of parents in the month of September, your kids are getting back to school, you're getting back into the habit. The focus on home in September is super heavy until you're in your new routine, right? That is inevitable. That's going to happen. So maybe you're not taking the trips and vacation time is over, but you can plan a family game night or something that still lets you have fun, right? But if you were trying to do it the balanced way, you'd have as much fun as you have work and that that's not sustainable. I know that this elevation approach, uh, and, I, and I really relate to this and appreciate it, it's a very um, detailed framework. Like you've taken this, like a lot of people have an idea of like, oh, I should... I should harmonize my life. And then they're like, maybe I'll maybe I'll reschedule my dentist appointment or something. But no, you took it a lot further. And I'd love if you could, I mean, the time we have, maybe share that framework, almost give like a like a, a quick, you know, introductory course on on how we apply this approach in our lives. Oh, of course. So I wanna take a step back and say, how did I get to this framework? Um I was at lunch with a friend and I was telling her about these books I had coming up. I was like, I've got seven new books. And, and, you know, she said, you know, I wish I could do that. She's like, I have an idea for something and I just can't get it out of my head. And as any entrepreneur will, will tell you, we hear like a light bulb goes off right when we hear this. And I thought, OK, this is a very talented friend of mine. If she's having this issue or other people having this issue, I know I had this issue um, and I needed the framework for myself because I was always stuck in a loop of coming up with a big idea and socializing it and then going back to work on it. And I felt like I was never launching anything and burning out, right? That's the two worst things that could happen, that you're never accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish and you're going through the burnout. Um, And so what I realized is I had developed, now it's a four-phase approach, but for a while I was existing in the first two phases. And so the four phases of the elevation approach are preparation, inspiration, recreation, and transformation. And I was caught in a loop of preparation and inspiration, meaning 
I do all the background work to get an idea where it needed to go. And then an inspiration is when I socialize it. I get really excited by talking to all the people in my my community. I'd network like the best of them. And then I go back to trying to perfect it. And I never really did anything. So when I introduce recreation, which to any entrepreneur, the idea that we're going to take a little bit of rest, I think is the most counterintuitive thing ever. Um, but when I started to incorporate that and I tested it, took years and years and years to get to the point of being good for me of adding recreation. But once I got the recreation in, I was able to finally transform and launch things. And, and I was able to start launching a lot of things and getting a lot of books done and product lines because I really then systematized everything. And so the book takes you through not just these four phases, but I realized I couldn't get from like phase one to two without a few principles of what we call instant elevation. So and, and just to give you an example, in preparation, the three core principles there are first to declutter your space, second to get curious, and third to know your numbers, right? And then every phase has these little instant elevations that will help you get to the next mm -hmm. phase. And so there's a book, uh, the workbook just launched in September. I love the workbook. It has tons of exercises that will help you achieve work-life harmony. And really, the book ultimately asks you a lot of questions um, and, and really requires that you get a really introspective and say, what do I want in this stage in my life? What does true harmony feel like for me? And then how do I go about achieving my version of work-life harmony, right? It's not Tina's version. It's your custom-made version of what work-life harmony looks like for you. So I, uh, I, I, I'm super interested. The, 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 the idea that really stuck out to me um, because it's uh, what I need to hear is this idea that when you insert recreation, the preparation, inspiration, transformation, loop, call it loop, becomes possible. And I, it's funny. That, so let me share the visual that came to mind when, when you alluded to that. Um, every morning I have uh, this, you know, I have my little morning routines and my concoctions. And one of them is actually very gross, but I'm proud of it. It's, uh, it's apple cider, raw apple cider vinegar mixed with pre-workout. To go before I go to the gym. Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> and then I dilute it with alkaline water, right? And I recently, so so I get in the gym, I get in the car, go to the gym with my wife, and I'm always drinking this thing in a cup, and I'm trying not to spill it on myself every time she she, she drives because I have to drink this drink. And finally, she's like, "Just, I cannot handle the smell of that drink in the car. I'm just waking up. We're going to the gym. It's like five thir five or six in the morning." And she's like. So I started putting it in a bottle with a top so that the smell wouldn't be wafting out in the car. And as soon as I did that, I had I had my sorry, this is kind of a long dorky yeah. story, but I had my <laughs> my proportions, my quantities that I measured of the different ingredients and I put it in the in this this bottle that has a top on it now and it fills it up right to the brim and I go to shake it and you can't shake a bottle if it's too full. It needs some extra space to slosh around and and develop, let's say. So you see where I'm going with this metaphor. It's yeah. like recreation. And so then I I said, okay, I'm going to cut back on my quantity of water. So there's which makes it taste even grosser. But um, now there's room to shake the bottle. And I feel like what you're saying is, if you want to develop as an entrepreneur, or as a as a liver of this harmonious, high production, high performance life, you got to leave a little room in the bottle so that it can slosh around and, and develop. Absolutely. And also, it just makes space for newness to come to you, right? New ideas. Like as entrepreneurs, we thrive with ideas. I can't tell you how often I go into like a slow flow yoga class. And this is maybe midpoint of my day, like three or four o'clock. There's a lot of day that's happened, right? And I'm just thinking about things, right? And I don't go in with any intention of like certain. And I come out and I'm like, oh, this is how I solve this problem. This is how I solve that problem. And I really believe that like the solutions came because I just got off the train for a minute, right? When you're on the train where you're looping, you're going, there's no time for anything to just come to you, right? And we all know as entrepreneurs, however you find that like divine space, that divine, you need to get that inspiration from somewhere, right? And that is what feeds us as entrepreneurs. It allows us to go be who we need to be to our communities, to our, our stakeholders. And so you have to have some fun. You know, you have to display. And I, I think you said this earlier when we started talking, you were talking about watching your kids. The thing I love most about watching children is they know how to play. 
they've nailed it, right? They know how to play and how to have fun and that they know how to be curious. And I, I talk a lot in the book about like what we can learn from the kids in our lives and just that idea that you have to make some space. And I, I say, just try it, right? So if you can't, I am not expecting that you're going to read this book and say, okay, clearing my schedule for two weeks. It's like, start with 15 minutes and see how you respond to that 15 minutes and, and you know, check it. Make sure that you're like, oh, this happened because I took that 15, like constantly give yourself that checkup to say, am I improving? Does this feel better? And you will inevitably give yourself more time, right? If you start measuring that, if you start measuring the effects recreation is having, you're going to add more of it and you're going to notice you're getting done as much, if not more. It's easier. It feels lighter. And that's when the harmony piece starts to kick in. I love it. I mean, it is right there in the word, right? Recreation. Yeah, it's true. Um, okay. So that since you were 24 years old, you've basically only done four things, which is re uh, research, write, teach, and travel. And that everything else, all the way down to like cooking meals and doing laundry and whatnot, you've delegated. And so you live this uh, sort of wonderfully polymathic, almost utopian existence on your ship. And I don't know, bring us all up to speed. Am I am I capturing it correctly? And, and is that in fact what you're still doing? Yeah, I, I'm pretty well useless except for those, those few things. <laughs> I, I, I love learning. I love sharing. I love traveling. And so I do delegate everything else away. So I, I try not to, I, I learned many, many years ago that every human being has a set of priorities, a set of values, a hierarchy of values that they live their life by. And each perception, decision, and action they take is based on it. And if you don't fill your day with the very highest priority, most meaningful, most inspiring, most intrinsically driving activities, you'll devalue yourself. And you'll less the probability of attracting your what's innermost in your thoughts is as your dream. So I delegate everything else. I don't cook and drive and do any of those other things. I have people specializing and that love doing that around me to take care of things. And I just teach, research, and write. And this is the fifth presentation. I have another one at midnight tonight, so I just do them pretty well most of the time. <laughs> you know, drop out surfer bum uh tur you know grew up dyslexic overcame cognitive challenges and ultimately emerged as kind of like this you know intellectual butterfly um who's now achieved i would say the dream although some might say well my dream is not to live on a ship and you know read and write and and, and teach all the time but the point is that was doctor that was your dream and you've achieved it so maybe you could talk about that assume let's assume the audience is some context on your on your life journey, how were you able to to inflect your life to ultimately this or or this destination of like literally living your dream? I mean, it's like if you think of Maslow's hierarchy as like five levels, you sort of you spend basically most of your waking time and energy in that fifth level, and it's like the lower four you've essentially delegated to others. So, so how did you pull that off? Well, I did read Personality and Motivation by Maslow, and I've, I've devoured, you know, anything to do with maximizing human awareness and potential has been on my agenda. But in 1982, October, late October, I went to a Walden's bookstore, and there was a chain called Walden. Right. Back when there was such a thing, right? Yeah, Thoreau, from David Thoreau, possibly. But... Um, this book, I was walking through there and I found this book called The Time Trap by Alec McKenzie. And I picked it up and browsed it and I went, that's the, you know, how you pick a book and you just go, that's that's where I'm at now. I, that's the book. And I picked up this book and I devoured that book and dog-eared the book and marked the book and summarized it. And summarized it into a six-step process. This is gold to entrepreneurs. I've shared it with governments. I've shared it with corporations. I've shared it. It's, it's really, it's, it's gold. So what I did is I took a piece of paper, a series of pieces of paper, and I put five lines on it, made six equal space columns. And I hope that everybody will do this because I'm certain it will be a value. Now, in the first column on the left, you write down every single thing you're doing in a day. 
And not just one day, but over a three-month period, you're scanning in your mind and you're thinking, how do I spend my day? What's the truth about how I'm spending my day? What's the fact? If I had a drone looking over me, regardless of what I said, what would the drone see? What's the fact of what you're doing in a day from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed? And to really, truly introspect and reflect on what are you doing? Because it's easy to say, I want to do this, and but it it's really takes, you know, you can walk on coals and you can bungee jump to show your courage, but the courage to be true to yourself is more courageous than jumping off, off bungee jumps. So really look honestly at what you're doing with your day. When I did that, as I did that list, which was extensive, I made a list because I was doing a lot of stuff. And I, I broke it down into personal and professional. Home and at work. And when I did, I in, intuitively was prompting, no wonder I'm not as productive as I could be because I'm doing a lot of low priority stuff. Yeah. I'm doing a lot of stuff that I got to, I have to, I must, I should, I ought to, I supposed to, I need to, instead of what I really love to do. The tyranny of the urgent, as they say. Yes. Well, we subordinate to outer authorities instead of give ourselves permission to be the authority in many cases. So I, I, I made that list. And as I was doing it, I was already already realizing I was majoring in minors and minoring in majors. It was already starting to surface. The second column was how much productivity, what is the dollar value that those actions produce? which meant that I am caring enough about other people in humanity to meet their needs with my skills and services enough where they would pay for it. Because mm -hmm. if you're not doing something meaningful, I don't really believe the person can have complete fulfillment unless they're also doing some sort of service for people. That's just my observation. So I asked, how much is this producing per hour? What is the real true productive economic return of that. Not that money is the only measurement, but it is a way of measuring sustainable fair exchange. So I wrote that down and boy, was I blown away by that one because I realized that even though I spent 10 years of going to school for a particular expertise, the actual expertise wasn't producing the greatest amount per dollar of, of per hour. The most productive thing that I was doing was going out and sharing uh, my mission as a message for people to engage them in potentially participating in what I was doing as a speaker, which was like, oh, I could produce uh, fifteen to $18,000 an hour doing that. And if I'm in my cubicle as a clinician, I might make fifteen to $1,800 an hour instead of fifteen to 18000 an hour. And here I was trained for 10 years to do this clinical thing, but it wasn't the most productive thing as far as serving people. Leveraging myself through speaking was more leverageable, more, more valuable, but I didn't want to face that. It was, it was awkward to face that. But I made a list of everything that I did down to every little action step and what it produced, and there was a lot of zeros down there, a whole lot of zeros I wasn't getting paid for. And when I realized that, I prioritized it on what produced the most, second most, third most, all the way down. I reprioritized that list when I got through. So that list was multiple pages, and I prioritized the whole list. And that was a real eye-opener to realize that I'm doing stuff, not because it's most productive, but because it's what you're expected to do as a, as a profession. So when I got through that list, I already knew that I needed to go in a certain direction with that if I was going to actually be the most productive and most meaningful thing in, in my career. Then I went to the third column. And the third column was how much meaning on a one to 10 scale does it bring? Meaning, you said, M-E-A-N. Yeah. How okay. meaningful, how inspiring and meaningful is this? If I can't wait to get up and do it, and I, it's the most inspiring thing I can do. That that's a ten, you know. As if, if you're, as Buffett says, if you're not tap dancing to work, you haven't found what you really love to do, right? Right. So I'd made a list of from all the way to the top down to the bottom, from ones to tens, 
on that list? What is it I can't, what do I spontaneously do? What nobody has to extrinsically motivate me to do. That's a 10. And with anything that needs a little push and a little reminding, those are down below. But I made a list and I reprioritized that list from 10 down to ones. And there were quite a few ones, but there was a few tens. Then I looked at what was most productive and most meaningful because I want to do something that serves humanity, but at the same time, I want to do something that I can't wait to do so I can have my vocation, my vacation. So I looked at and I, I integrated the ones that produced the most, most meaning and most productivity dollar wise. And it luckily had a lot of overlap. There were some that were the same. So I was really blessed when I got that list and I looked at that and I go, these are the things that are most productive, but these are the things I can't wait to do. So I reprioritized those and looked at that and cross-referenced those. In the next column, number four, I, uh, I identified to the best of my ability, extrapolated what would it cost per hour for delegating that action. And that wasn't just the salaries, that was the equipment, that was the parking, that was the promotion, that was the bonuses, that was the training. It, it, I tried to get as nitpicky, as anal as I could about what the cost, the true cost of having somebody do that. And I don't mean just somebody who's average, but somebody knows more about it than me that is absolutely highest on their value list to do that. Because if they're not inspired to do it spontaneously, I'm going to have to micromanage them and push them and all this other stuff. I don't want to do that. I want to be free to do what I'm inspired to do that produces the most. So I went through there and then I looked at the spreads between what what produced the most per hour versus what cost. And I looked at the spreads and then I prioritized that list so I knew what things to be delegating and to extract surplus labor value out of people and to give job opportunities because I'm helping the economy, which anytime you help the economy and give job opportunities, you're helping your own, your own economy. In the next column, I looked at what was the actual time per day that would be applied. Because sometimes I did things every two weeks, and sometimes I did once a week. Once, and sometimes I do every single day for three hours. And so I, I looked at the time that was involved. And then the final column, I put down what is the final prioritization based on all the variables. I'm going to finalize this prioritization. What is the most productive, most meaningful, that would be most wise for me to, to do? And what is the thing that would, is the most wise to delegate? Once I had that data. And then I divided that entire list into 10 layers and put job descriptions in those layers for that job. And that, that job. And then when I was hiring people, I learned through trial and error to People never go to work for the sake of a company. They go to work to fulfill what they value most. And if they can feel, feel that they're fulfilling their values, they're engaged. They're not, they're theory X people, not theory Y people. They have to be extrinsically motivated instead of intrinsically called. They're living by duty and not design, in other words. So I made sure that when I hired somebody, I asked, how is doing this action going to help you fulfill what's most meaningful to you? If they couldn't answer that, I didn't. I didn't go by what they said. I, I go by how quick they were congruent in their answers on those questions. And then I hired people to do it so I was freed and I didn't have to push people, motivate people, or manage people, or micromanage people, or you know, control people. You know, Buffett's good at not having to control the CEOs of the companies that are subsidiaries because he's got quality people in there. Mm -hmm. And surrounding yourself with quality people, A people, not Z people, liberates you. So I went through a few trials and errors and got some people that didn't match and I had to do it again in a couple of cases. But every time I dissolved a layer, I lifted my energy level. I lifted my vision level. I expanded my space and time horizons. I freed myself to do what was more inspiring. I freed myself to do something we're more productive. And I felt lighter and inspired and I couldn't wait to do it. And when you can't wait to go to work doing what you love to do, People can't wait to get that. So it was Peter Lynch that said something that really inspired me when in the 1990s. He said, after I've done my technical and my quantitative analysis on 
what stocks to select, right? He was a great selector for Fidelity. He said, once I've narrowed it down, I actually go to location to the flagship center where the main headquarters of the company is. And I go and walk around and meet with the people from the company. And I'm looking for six things. I'm looking for people who are grateful for their job, love what they're doing, inspired by the vision, enthusiastically, energetically working, certain about their skill and present when you're with them. If he sees that, he is certain that 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 company is going to appreciate in value when he sees that as a general scheme. So I maximize those basic things. Gratitude for what I was doing, love what I was doing, inspired by my vision, enthusiastically working, you know, certain about my skill because now I'm getting to master my skill and find that one thing, as Gary Keller says, that gives you the competitive advantage, comparative advantage, and I'm present because I'm due to, I don't get distracted by low priority things. I'm present. I'm at the top of the the heat. And I start doing that at 27. And I was in a 970 square foot little clinical office with one staff member. And 18 months later, I had five doctors, 12 staff members, and made 10 times more net income doing only the highest priority things. And I never turned back. And I, I said no to anything else since then. I learned to give myself permission to do what I really love on a daily basis and delegate the rest away. Dedicate to what's highest in priority, delegate anything less. So do me a quick favor. Um, Peter Lynch, for anybody that didn't catch the reference, was the manager of the Magellan Fund for Fidelity, yes. which I don't I don't remember the exact statistic, but I mean, it's arguably or certainly one of the best performing uh, funds over the long arc of, I think he was, he did that for 40 years. And he was a kind of a, a, a a value investor, like value was his his investing style, which is to say he would he would find companies that he knew the market was under. And I, I grew up, my dad was a value investor, money manager. So I actually was like a big, I was a, I was an eight-year-old who was probably a bigger fan of Peter Lynch than I was of like Jose Canseco or some famous athlete at the time. So uh, you're speaking my language, but uh, he would find companies that he just knew were intrinsically being undervalued by the market. And he would just he would buy the stock and wait. And and he 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 would famously quip that, you know, he made most of his money, I think, after four or five years of owning a stock, because he just he, he would say, it's actually, and this is such a good lesson for life. He would say, the longer it takes for me to win, the more certain I I am that I'm going to win, because it means I was that much earlier than everyone else. Yes. And that that is a concept. Um but, well, it, but deferred man. gratification, deferred gratification is more profound. And what's interesting is the space and time horizons inside the human psyche spontaneously expand to the degree of the congruency with your highest value. So okay. the second you by what's highest in your value, your space and time horizons grow. Seneca said you measure an individual by their most distant ends. How big a space and time is their innermost dominant thought? I've said for years, if you want to make a difference in yourself, you need a vision as big as your your family. If you want to make a difference in your family, you need a vision as big as your community. If you want to make a difference in your community, you need a vision as big as your city. You want to make number one in the city, need a vision as big as your state. You want to be number one in the state, have a vision as big as the nation. You want to be number one in the nation, have a global vision. If you want to make a global difference, have an astronomical vision. I have an audio program called Activating Awakening Your Astronomical Vision, and that comes from congruency between what you're doing every day. It's not It's not about comparing yourself to other people. It's about comparing your daily actions to your own highest values and how integral and congruent you are. That will automatically expand your space and time horizons and develop the wisdom of patience and long-term visions and thinking. And Peter was example of that, and Munger and Buffett were all examples of that. And they're still smarter than half the guys that are flipping and trading. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely going to love this one. Check it out. Only one person out of billions could be number one at anything. The important thing is not being number one. The important thing is improvement. There's some set of things that you should learn where you can essentially what I call skip the line so that you could be in the top, you know, one to five percent of your field.